everyone, and welcome to our Biochar 2030 Roadmap Launch Webinar. I'm Sam Zagami, the current Cluster Manager at Ansbig. I'm joined today by Ansbig's CEO, Don Coyne, Ansbig's Chair, Nigel Murphy, Stephen Joseph, who sits on our Executive and Advisory Boards, and the three very qualified authors who will be leading the delivery of the Biochar Roadmap. They are Sean Scallon from Sustainability Plus, Melissa Rebick from Climate and Agricultural Support, and Russ Martin from MS2. To find out more about our team, please see their bios on our website, ansbig.org. Firstly, um, to start off, I just wanna thank our sponsor of today's webinar, New World Pavement Solutions, a company as part of New World Group of Companies, whose main goal is, and they coined this, Let's go carbon net negative together. They are not only our foundational members, but also diamond sponsors of our roadmap. And we are very grateful for the support and contribution that they make to ANSBIG. Um, just to kind of give you a snapshot of what to expect in our webinar today, um, I'm just gonna run through our agenda. So Don will be opening up our webinar with a quick synopsis of ANSBIG and our objectives. Sean will then come on to discuss the biochar opportunity. Melissa will then speak about the agricultural biochar blueprint and the role it has in our roadmap. Ross will then come on to uh, discuss the process of producing the biochar roadmap. And then Don will come in to explain how you can get involved in the roadmap and at the end, we'll then be going on to Q and A's. And just as I'm um, coming in and speaking here now, please have a look in the chat and tell us where you're tuning in from. It'd be great. We know that we have a, a worldwide uh, biochar family. So it's always great to see where people are coming in. And we have a really a, a wonderful lineup uh, of presenters and presentations today to help you understand why we feel that there's a need for the biochar roadmap and what we hope to achieve from it. A little bit of, um, I suppose, tech issues from my point of view. If you have any questions throughout each of our presentations, please just put in the questions in the Q&A tab, tab and we'll do our best to get to everyone's questions at the end. Now, I am very happy to hand it over to Don. Thank you, Sam. Um, I'll share my screen and um... Hopefully that's, uh, I don't think we, we got that right. So I'll try again. Um, and we're going into present mode there. So you should be able to see my screen correctly now. So uh, welcome to um, our members and, and uh, subscribers and uh, other interested uh, followers uh, of the uh, biochar. Um, I, um, as Sam mentioned, the current CEO of Ansbig, and my background is, is horticulture, education and training and frontline management. And uh, uh, I was the, uh, one of the co-founders of the ANZ Biochar Conference and initiative, uh, which was sold uh, to Ansbig um, when we uh, rebranded ourselves in 2020. So we're coming up um, into the second year anniversary uh, of operations of as ANSBIG as a cluster model, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more in the program. So ANSBIG, um, just to give you a, a background, is uh, the ANZ Biochar Industry Group. Um, it assists companies governments and institutions in the effective use and production of biochar. ANSBIG's uh, objectives are to bring together uh, biochar companies and institutions working in the industry. It, we facilitate collaboration between biochar cluster companies, governments and research organisations. We are there to provide a strong voice to government to ensure that companies producing and using biochar are suitably encouraged and supported. We establish networks, experience and institutional knowledge that can benefit uh, export development, commercialization, risk management and growth of biochar clusters and uh, companies and institutions. 
and also to market the successes of the sector and create a recognised and reputable biochar cluster brand. Our challenges are reversing ecosystem damage, uh, extract, extracting carbon from the atmosphere and storing it, um, too much waste, wasted resources and combating climate change. So uh, that's just a bit of a background about ANSBIC and I'm now going to hand over to our next speaker, which is Sean Scallon, who's uh, Principal at Sustainability Plus and also uh, a member of ANSBIC's advisory board. So over to you, Sean. Thanks, Don. I'll just share my screen right now. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. I'll go through. Something's happened to my display on my screen, but I've got that one up. All right. So when we talk about biochar, we, perhaps to do a bit of a recap is what I thought I'd start off with. And biochar is made out of waste biomass, things like council green waste, agricultural residues, a range of biomasses that are available and are wasted currently, um, straw, bag ass, et cetera. And so you can make biochar also out of food waste, out of sewerage, tyres, timber, Anything that's been um, biomass or living can be made into biochar. So we could take these waste resources and we can actually extract some more value out of them. And that value is the biochar, which can be used in many different applications. So uh, those applications range and are growing almost by the day and include agriculture, water and waste, water treatment, concrete roads, plastics, food, health, beauty products, textiles, batteries, consumer products, to name a few. Tip of the iceberg is, is the key uh, phrase here. And biochar is an enabler of our new carbon economy. This is very important because we need to capture and store carbon to avoid its emissions to the environment. And also the, the important part and element of biochar is that it can store carbon, but also improve the soils in agricultural applications. So going through to my next slide, Sid. So what is biochar and what is PI-CCS? So it's a carbon capture and storage. I borrowed these slides from the market update from the European Biochar Industry Corporate uh, Consortium from a uh, presentation they did uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so that's what biochar looks like for a recap and for anyone who doesn't know, it is a highly versatile material. So agriculture and construction is listed there, but I've listed some of the other applications. So when we talk about car carbon capture, what we're saying is we're putting uh, this biomass, converting the biomass into carbon, and then we're putting it into an application either in the land, into the soil, so it gets captured for a very long time, or into products. So we're building up an inventory of carbon, if you like, in products that hasn't uh, then got back as CO2 into the environment because it's burnt or, or it's degraded. So it avoids those emissions. So we call it pyrogenic carbon capture and storage because the um, biochar is made using a process called pyrolysis. And I'll talk a little about that but not too much, but essentially we reduce the biomass to charcoal is, is a good way of looking at it. So many different sources and applications of, um, of, of biomass for biochar. As you can see here, there is a range of what are plant materials plus sewage sludge as an example. And then biochar can be made at different temperatures and have different properties because they are made at those different temperatures. So that's important to note. The biochar can be made to suit the application. Biochar doesn't, it isn't, uh, biochar ain't biochars is what we say. 
it can be tuned for particular applications and blended with other elements to suit a particular application. So that's just something to bear in mind with that. So a range of, of things can make um, biochar. So under the electron microscope, it looks like this. Uh, lots of pores, and the pores are really important for the functionality of biochar in soil in particular. So that's, that's a, a little uh, fun fact. And the market opportunity is what I wanted to talk about. There is a huge market opportunity for biochar and, and it is being realised. I wanted to illustrate this with a, a screen, uh, which is now off to my right because of the way the presenting thing's working. And so you get very high value uh, biochar products at the top of the, the pyramid. And as you go down, uh, the cost or the, the price per tonne you can achieve gets less because it's um, a lesser quality uh, product and the sector it goes into uh, demands a lower cost for their application. So everything from um, remediation of soils through to soil additives in soil through to feed uh, of, of livestock up to things like graphene and activated carbon production, which are high value products from biochar. So that's to give you a bit of an orientation there. Um, so the biochar use in Australia, this is a snapshot from work done by Robin Joseph in 2019. You can have a look there yourselves, but it's, there's a range of things. Reduce soil greenhouse gas emissions is noted there. Soil carbon and greenhouse gas emissions are there. I just wanted to mention those, call out the carbon capture element of it. And because I'll come back to that. But as you can see, there's quite a range of things that you can use biochar for. So an example of a large mar market globally for biochar are carbon comp composites. In 2018, 150,000 tonnes of carbon uh, composite were used worldwide. And the projection for that, this market in terms of value is worldwide in 2024, it's a $131 billion market just for carbon co composites, which is just one small application of biochar. So the breakdown on the, on the right shows you some of the elements for these composites or some of these types of composites that make up that volume. So there's a market. So talking about carbon capture, I just wanted to put the context because we will mention these later. I think uh, Melissa will mention these too. There's this six negative emission technologies which help facilitate carbon drawdown. And the one that we're talking about here is the one in the middle, um, the biochar pi CCS one. So basically putting carbon into the soil, but you can put it into other products as well. So that's, that's where we are. So these are, these are accepted applications of uh, negative emissions technologies. Some of them are more technologically involved, like capturing uh, carbon from the air and storing it, pumping it underground. Um, we, we kind of like our nature-based solution uh, for storing carbon. So the predictions are that biochar uh, uh, pyrogenic carbon capture and storage will likely dominate the, the net market. Out of those six, it's, this is likely to dominate it in terms of volume for the next decade. And these are projections that the European Biochar Industry Consortium made. Uh, so it's a big area of opportunity and that's just the carbon capture element of it. So what does, what does, um, what does the growth look like in Europe as an example that we can follow. So the compound annual growth rate in 2018 to 2021 was 50%, and it's likely to increase 67% in the rolling three years from 2019. As you can see, it's gone through a learning curve. So if you remember solar and its learning curve, it became exponential. And that's what we're seeing, we're in that growth phase now. It's very important to know that there is a big opportunity here from a market perspective. And I wanted to really illustrate that. So what is possible in the eight years we have remaining to 2030, which is the target of our uh, roadmap 
and it is this. In 2012, in Europe, there were three EVC certified plants, in one in each of three countries, and they produced about 500 tonnes per annum. In 2021, we have 50 facilities in nine countries with 40,000 tonnes per annum. That's an 800 times increase. So you can see what the opportunities are for here. We're starting um, a little way back. So um, you can see that could be us quite easily if we get this plan right. And so to finish, um, we do need to scale the biochar industry to address this, the challenges that we've outlined. We need to scale fast. We do need a plan and a plan for a new carbon economy. And so the roadmap for the biochar industry is what we need. And I'll stop sharing my screen there and hopefully I'll return to the other screen and I have. And I'll introduce Melissa now, who's gonna talk about agriculture, which is the leading application of biochar. Hi, Melissa. Hi. And so Melissa is an expert and will talk us through the benefits of biochar. Her work in uh, producing an agricultural blueprint detailing a plan to develop the agricultural sector uh, as well. And this will aid and integrate what we are doing with the roadmap for the whole industry. So over to you, Melissa. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for that great intro. I just would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waters in which we meet today. Um, I'm on Narangeri land and just wanted to also acknowledge that the traditional custodians um, are uh, traditional users of biochar also. So um, agriculture is the leading user of biochar and um, hence the, um, the roadmap needed for uh, the, the blueprint needed for agriculture. Um, as Sean has shown, biochar provides a range of valuable carbon-based products and services with multiple environmental, agricultural, economic and social co-benefits. It provides positive effects on biochemical, soil processes, animal productivity, benefiting agriculture, food and energy security. And there has been um, a meta-analysis, there's over 4,000 published papers uh, with the, the benefits of um, you know, on increased crop yields, animal, animal production, feed conversion, milk yield, soil carbon and production, reducing greenhouse gases, improving soil health, uh, the cascading circular potential by using biochar, many, many opportunities um, by producing it, but also circular opportunities in using it. It is also using a waste and converting it to energy. Uh, why a roadmap and blueprint for agriculture? Um, well, agricultural biochar is a cellulosic material that has been pyrolyzed. Um, in other words, it's fired in a low oxygen environment, such as a kiln, and everything is removed but the carbon. So most biochars are around 80 to 90% carbon. In that removal process, you end up with byproducts, including bio oil, bio gas, um, and wood vinegar that can also be utilized. It's estimated that there's 50 to 100 million metric tons per year of biomass residues that go into landfill and provide methane gas or a burn, which provide carbon, carbon into the atmosphere. This residue can be converted to biojar and produce 10 to 30 million metric tonnes per year in Australia. It has a potential economic value of $7.5 to $15 billion. Agriculture provides a large proportion of these residues that we can deem no longer as a waste, but as a product. So as an analogy, and I just want to look at this table produced by Samuel and Rod, which, uh, and Joseph, which uh, um, Sean also alluded to. It just looks at that net user benefit of using biochar. So for the, every tonne of biochar, the net user benefit ranges from $100 per tonne of biochar up to $20,000 per tonne of biochar. If we were to average that net user benefit to just $2,000, of biochar, 
and 5 million tonnes of biochar is used in agriculture from the available 30 million tonnes that could be produced. That's a net benefit of $30 billion per year for agriculture. Just another point that's not on my slide is that, um, so for example, if agriculture used five tonnes per hectare on just 1 million hectares of agricultural land, that's being used on 0.002% of our agricultural land. So if it was spread at five tonnes per hectare on just 1 million um, hectares of our ag land, um, uh, that would um, be the 5 million tonnes of biochar that's used. So it's only you know, using us a small proportion of agricultural land to increase that net user benefit for, for agriculture. And so hence biochar alone has the potential to support the Australian government agricultural productivity of 100 billion in farm gate output by 2030, if we go on a benefit of 10 billion per year. It is also can provide the Australian roadmap to carbon neutrality and have a big input into that. Australia, so agriculture and biochar, Australia is using 1.5 to 1.6 times the resources it can, that the planet can recreate in one year. The notion of biochar means all carbon created, we should say below the atmosphere, stays below the atmosphere. So the notion of biochar in itself means that we are no longer emitting our wastes to the atmosphere via methane from landfill or by burning. We no longer lose carbon because biochar captures and stores carbon. Biochar and land and animal management together have the ability to reverse the past two centuries of anthropogenic emissions. There are circular economic opportunities for both producing and using biochar in agriculture, and there are expanding opportunities for trading carbon. So the carbon drawdown, by removing 10 to 30 million tonnes of negative CO2 emissions, we mitigate much of Australia's total greenhouse gas emissions. In addition, biochar can be used in the soil to build soil health, promote photosynthesis and carbon sequestration. So when Sean showed his six circles and ways to reduce methane, agriculture can cover off on about five of those because you, you are also using it in agriculture to gain an extra carbon sequestration or methane reduction by feeding it to animals. Biochar should be a part of the agricultural sector contribution towards net zero. It can also be monetized and produce extra income for farmers, depending on how that is marketed. For example, marketing your produce as carbon negative or net zero, but also um, improving your productivity and gaining those extra carbon credits. Biochar has been identified by the IPCC, International Panel on Climate Change, as key negative emission technology to address climate change, sequestering carbon reliably long-term only soils containing plants, because we need the photosynthesis, can sequester carbon. Australia, half of Australia is owned by farmers. So about soils and biochar, the top 10 centimetres of soil sustains most life on earth. Fertile soils rich in organic matter are our best insurance against food insecurity and climate vulnerability. Soil is a major store of carbon containing three times as much as the atmosphere and five times as much as forests. A principal component of soil carbon is humus, a stable form of organic carbon with an average lifetime of a thousand years in the soil. Biochar lasts up to a thousand years in the soil. It is estimated that at least 50% of carbon in the earth's soil has been released into the atmosphere over the past centuries. Biochar can help put carbon back into the soil. Biochar is a unique soil conditioner. Once in the soil, it becomes colonised by microbes, which we need to continue to build up because we only have around 10 years left in many of our top soils. One piece of charcoal has a surface area of 1,000 to 2,000 square metres because of all the micropores. That's the size of an average house. For every 1%, we increase soil carbon we give an extra 10 to 30 extra tonnes of water held in the soil 
which can equate to an extra 10 to 30% increase in production. The drawdown and economics with regenerative agriculture are really important as well. But biochar is not just for regenerative agriculture. Biochar can be combined with traditional fertilizers with, such as uh, nitrates and ammonium, and um, they, they don't leach as much through the soil. They last in the soil longer and they do not denitrify. But from the drawdown economics from Regen Ag, it's estimated 108 million acres in America of current adoption that regenerative agriculture will increase to a total of 1 billion acres by 2050. The rapid adoption is based on the historic growth rate of organic agriculture, as well as a projected conversion of conservation agriculture to regenerative agriculture over time. This could result in a total reduction of 23.2 gigatons of carbon dioxide from both sequestration and reduced emissions. Regen Ag could provide 1.9 trillion in financial return by 2050 on an investment of 57 billion. Biochar is recognized as a drawdown methodology, biochar being up to 90% carbon. Each tonne put back into the earth is carbon drawdown. So what does the biochar roadmap look like? Well, so what does the blueprint include? It will be a pathway for high level identification of economic, environmental and social opportunities for further investment in biochar production, commercialization and usage. To release the potential, to realize the potential annual gross value of production for biochar to a minimum of 150 million by 2030 by producing a minimum of 300,000 tonnes of biochar, including high grade biofeeds, biominerals and other value added byproducts. And it will support the Australian government agricultural productivity target of 100 billion in farm gate output by 2030 by applying biochar to agriculture. And it will help realise the carbon drawdown opportunities with biochar, working with governments and the international voluntary market. Um, the biochar blueprint will identify research development and commercial demonstration priorities and opportunities over the next 10 years for biochar agricultural use for climate resilience and carbon drawdown. It will identify gaps, barriers and response measures for industry development, current and potential markets for biochar applications, further development needed to empower ANSPIG to work across the value chain to grow the industry and economic, environmental and social opportunities for further investment in biochar production, commercialisation and usage. Nearly finished. Um, investment priorities um, will include these range of things shown on the screen. I think I'm running out of time, but I, I hope you can all scroll down. I'm just going to open my door. I'm very sorry. My apologies. Um, so the processes will be uh, stakeholder identification with 50 stakeholders from a broad cross-section cross across the value chain. Um, then we're going to um, identify some RDE commercialization priorities uh, with a group of 50 in a survey. The survey will be analyzed. There'll be focus uh, stakeholder interviews. Stakeholder workshops, which we hope to will um, be part of a summit that we're planning in August or September in South Australia, a literature review, high level opportunity in assessment, followed by a strategic action plan that will be the outcome. Um, the blueprint, the outcome of the blueprint will be used by ANZEG to Australia, New Zealand Biochar Industry Group to work across the value chain with RD&E organisations and commercial partners to conduct priority research and development objectives to reach a target minimum goal in the biochar industry of 150 million per annum for the um, gross value of production for agriculture by 2030. Uh, it will achieve carbon drawdown. Governments, researchers and the like will be able to better support primary industries and agriculture to reach its productivity target and carbon drawdown target by using biochar. The RDE uh, opportunities are on the screen. There's animal trials, soil health benefits, pasture crop production demonstration. There has been much research done to date 
but it is important to bring the farmers and researchers um, that are here in Australia uh, continuing along the ride with us. Um, last slide, um, New World Climate and Agriculture, which is a, a co-company uh, with uh, New World Pavement Solutions and New World Group, um, have developed a, a project that um, I'm part of and will be managing. Um, and this aims to make 30,000 tonnes of biochar from waste timber over the next three years as a start. New World Pavement Solutions, uh, platinum sponsor, will take 25,000 tonnes of the biochar for their cold mix to use in roads. 1,000 tonnes of biochar will be, will be provided for our DNA purposes and can piggyback on this blueprint. There'll be two technical officers that will be supported to conduct animal and soil health projects and two PhD students. That is a start and we're looking to partner um, with the RDNE organisations to um, support these officers and, and students. Uh, so I will now hand it over, thank you for your time, to uh, Russ who uh, has over, Russ Martin has over 30 years experience in product stewardship, public policy, bioenergy and sustainability, both in governments and as an advisor to industry and governments. These roles have been in the US, Australia, New Zealand and the Middle East. Russ is currently the director of MS2 and the CEO of Global Product Stewardship Council. Over to you, Russ. Thanks, Melissa. Um, wanted to just give a bit of an overview for where we're going with the, um, with the roadmap and how we'll get there in, uh, in delivering it. One of the things that we'll be targeting, are we seeing the slides yet? No, we're seeing a white screen, Russ, so <laughs> um, we'll just get that sorted. There yeah. There we go. Um, one, one of the reasons we wanted to develop the roadmap is because we see the industry at a critical stage and it's important to have ANSBIG's development that we've had to date, but we're at a point where we really need to try and uh, leverage the, what we've seen so far and, and the opportunities that present themselves. So we wanted to come up with an overall strategic direction and ensure that we can scale up and, and uh, effectively deploy the capability and capacity of the industry. Another important part is supporting market development in Australia, New Zealand, and beyond. There are a couple of things that we will um, do as well. One of the things we aim to do is align the different products, services, and benefits within the, the sectors. Uh, as, as Sean touched on, and we, we tend to say, chars ain't chars. There are a range of feedstocks, processes, and end uses that can all align themselves well if we have a strategic industry direction for doing that. We also want to show biochar's benefits and how those fit to government objectives, industry objectives, and the, the community at large, in particular, to help build things like social license to operate for a lot of the activities that were involved. And one of the things we really wanna do is capture the carbon drawdown benefits of, uh, of biochar and see where are the gaps in research and in things like carbon accounting methodologies and verification processes. The objectives, we wanna make sure that we're getting everybody in from the start. We've got the support of the industry, we've got support of government, and we can effectively help develop and promote market opportunities for the industry. We want to take a very commercial perspective on this so that uh, the different players have opportunities to be involved while achieving community and government objectives, including drawdown. We wanted to develop a, a, an eight-year plan to 2030 so that we can reflect the biochar industry being a major contributor to Australia's economic, environmental, and social well-being. And to do so, we really need to understand where are we at now, what are the gaps, what are the opportunities, and how can we add value across the supply chains? 
we wanted to make sure that we've got clear vision and targets on production and an understanding at least of potential applications coming along. These are emerging quite rapidly with biochar. We have a much better understanding of where different processes and feedstocks are at now. So we wanna make sure that we're trying to leverage that. And we wanna look for export opportunities in addition to uh, other potential. One of the things that we've seen all along is the, the benefit of the seaweed industry blueprint. We've uh, long felt that that's a, a good example to have as the basis, but we wanna make sure that we're incorporating Anne's big documents, Anne's big experience, and the strategic development work that we've implemented already across the industry. We'll have uh, the agricultural blueprint for South Australia that Melissa mentioned, and um, we'll also incorporate the, the work of other sectors, including uh, water utilities and the forestry sector re report on the stewardship strategy uh, that I did for the forestry sector. In terms of the overall process, we're conducting initial research now. We've developed a preliminary framework for the roadmap and how it would be structured. We'll be doing initial consultations to get a better feel, do some ground truthing, make sure we're on the right track and uh, start doing the strategic development around those issues based on that information. As I mentioned, we'll be integrating the industry action plan and ANSBIG's business plan. We'll pull these together in an issues or discussion paper that we will then make available in advance of the summit that we'll be holding. At the summit, we'll be facilitating stakeholder discussions on the second day of, of the event. And uh, I'll get into those, the detail on those in a minute. Then we'll draft a roadmap, uh, we'll, we'll circulate it, we'll get feedback on it and then finalize it. And that will end up giving us the 2030 industry roadmap and we'll show the fit with other action plans or blueprints for other sectors as well as the, the uh, South Australian agricultural blueprint. The process we'll be using for the stakeholder discussions is based on uh, an approach that I've, I've modified the existing Chatham House format. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, Chatham House is a think tank based in the UK. And the idea is that they would have influential speakers and discussions, but then the results of those are kept within the attendees. One of the things we wanna do is make sure that we have discussions that can be shared and we want a good constructive environment in which to have those discussions so people feel comfortable speaking up. So part of the approach that we're using is to not attribute particular thoughts, ideas, uh, discussion points to any individuals. We'll have our issues or discussion paper circulated at least two weeks prior to the summit so that participants have a chance to go through it, understand it, think through their, their questions. We'll review the, the, what we're trying to achieve with the roadmap and the process that we'll be following for the discussions, and then break into groups, each of which is addressing the same topics so that everybody's got a chance to address the same issues. Uh, we'll start by asking each group to appoint a scribe for reporting against the group discussions. And this helps to just get the group talking together more effectively and uh, start getting them on uh, some a, a productive framework. One of the things that we'll do is while individual thoughts will not be attributed to the, uh, to the individuals, the organizations that are represented in the discussions will be listed in the roadmap and the group outcomes will also be listed in the roadmap. Uh, this, this approach builds on uh, one we've applied in, in various stewardship forums, uh, one that we did in Sydney in 2010. Uh, we also did work for the, uh, for the state governments in Australia led by Victoria to develop a national paint stewardship scheme for 
architectural and decorative paint. And we, uh, we worked in conjunction with the stakeholders there to do the slide on the bottom right, which, in which we uh, can see areas of agreement around a framework. That was the, the first set of discussions that we had. That's how we kicked everything off. And if you look at the paint back program that's been in place for several years now, you'll see that the structure is essentially captured on the slide from our, our very first stakeholder discussions. We've also held uh, two international stewardship forums. One in Sydney in 2018 was to help review Australia's Product Stewardship Act. And we were doing this on behalf of the Australian government by having key stakeholders in the, uh, in the top shot that you'll see there, as well as international guests that we had, including the head of the environment director for the OECD. And we, we facilitated discussions around where Australia needs to go on product stewardship. Uh, in 2019, we did a similar approach in uh, Paris on behalf of the French Ministry for Environment to capitalize on our international stewardship forum discussions there. And again, it was to lay out kind of a global strategic position. I've also applied this in 2019, 2020 on behalf of New South Wales Department of Primary Industries for the Bioenergy Stakeholder Engagement Working Group. Quick overview of the, the timeframes for the roadmap. Um, we, we now have it underway with the launch and others will be addressing other aspects that we'll address. We're doing initial surveys and stakeholder discussions. We will then have the draft roadmap and discussion paper review uh, in September and October and aim for a first release in November, December. One of the things that, that we're keen to do is see this as an ongoing document. There will be revisions over time. This is more the, the first cut, the first release at it, but we'll, uh, as the industry grows and as we as we develop the stakeholder engagement, as people buy into the process more, we will continue to refine it over time. And with that, let me hand it over to Don. Thank you. Thank you very much, Russ. Russ and um, also to Melissa and Sean for um, excellent presentations. Um, we are very uh, pleased to have you on our team and uh, uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh, yeah, it's it's ex exciting how we, how this see this how this will roll out. So as um, Russ mentioned, we are having a uh, a summit uh, in in mid September, a two day summit. So we'll go into that a little bit more. But um, I mentioned before that Ansbig um, moved uh, to a cluster model uh, in um, uh, September of. Uh, uh, 2020, uh, sorry, July 2020. And um, there are three types of clusters. So at the moment, um, we, we are known as an emerging cluster. We've heard about the potential growth of the industry. Um, you know, we have a wide range of sectors and industries uh, already involved, but it is an incomplete ecosystem at the moment. Um, we aspire, um, so my role as, as CEO of Ansbig um, and our KPI is to grow the industry. Um, that's Ansbig's KPI and my KPI as the, as the CEO. So once we consolidate this decade as, as an emerging cluster, the idea is that we will reach a growth cluster by 2030. Um, which will move us into these high potential areas, will have a strong value creation um, and uh, uh, we'll have, you know, 10, 10 to 13 uh, other, other uh, countries involved, et cetera. And uh, the ultimate aspiration is, is to become a, uh, a, an innovation supercluster um, by, by 2050. Back in the 90s, when clusters were first formed, they worked off a, a triple 
helix model um so or framework if you like and that was seen uh, it was seen that the university uh industry and government that was known as the as the knowledge society and so over the coming years the triple helix model made its way into most uh, government's innovation policies leading to a, a large number of uh, uh, science parks technology transfer offices and close uh, industry university relations uh, relations um, eventually the triple helix uh, would become the backbone of many uh, innovation cluster programs connecting research government and industry into a close partnership but we are seeing uh, a shifting paradigm uh, so um, to uh, the five pillars of innovation clusters and this is what ANSBIG is now um, uh, working uh, towards. Uh, so over the past 20, 10 to 20 years, researchers, practitioners, and emerging innovation economies have shown that the triple helix was insufficient to explain uh, and support the entrepreneurial ecosystems emerging around the world. From China uh, to Israel, uh, recent uh, economic growth has showcased um, the power of the more entrepreneurial uh, economy. So academics from Harvard, MIT, BI have all added to the framework, eventually coming up, coming up with the entrepreneurial ecosystem model or the five point or Pentagon model. Um, in it, entrepreneurship and, and private risk capital is recognized as equally important pillars in the modern economy. Combined, these five make up the five pillars of innovative uh, uh, cluster, superclusters. So superclusters are, chip, uh, are shifting from the, the, the triple helix to Pentagon, and they all actively recruit members from corporate capital, uh, government, academia, and entrepreneurship. And then they go on to build a system level innovation engine for national and international uh, impact. If you want, we've heard about the potential um, of the, um, the biochar market. Um, we don't have a demand problem, we have a supply problem at this stage. Um, and if you want to just get a, a, a glimpse um, of, of, the, of what leading corporates are doing, uh, have a look at Microsoft's recent um, sustainability report. And for the second year in a row, um, they will be um, using biochar um, as, a for, as a carbon removal method. method. And uh, this is uh, actually through the voluntary uh, carbon market by Puro.Earth. And one of the suppliers uh, is our member uh, Rainbow Beta with the Echo 2 technology, which produces a clean syngas um, and, and produces biochar and wood vinegar. So uh, in doing that, um, we, we are more efficiently uh, using all of the, um, the biomass and, uh, and, and um, moving towards uh, a climate positive uh, technology. I'm just going to go uh, to a new share now. Um, so I will um, uh, just work this out uh, from my end if I can. Um, I'll exit the full screen. Um, so um, we, we have uh, actually um, uh, or would invite you um, to uh, become a, a roadmap sponsor. Uh, having said all this, you've met the team. Um, now we are looking uh, for sponsors uh, to assist in the funding of producing the, uh, the roadmap. Um, I uh, just uh, trying to get to, uh, just try and get out of this screen here. So as part of that, um, we are going, have launched a crowdfund campaign uh, today and uh, uh, you can view the video there. 
And we have a number of, uh, we've given you a little bit of context um, uh, there um, and all of the benefits that biochar uh, can provide, which we've heard about. But the problem is that we do urgently need direction uh, for the biochar industry. And, you know, this is why we are producing the, uh, the, the uh, biochar roadmap. Um, our first milestone target by midnight tonight uh, is for the human resources of 65,000 or 30% towards our overall target. Um, and we are currently 62% of the way towards that target. The second milestone is in three weeks uh, of 100,000 uh, to include the industry development of the roadmap. That is taking it to those five pillars. And the third milestone is uh, 200,000 in six weeks time or the end of the campaign um, to put on an invitation only two day summit in the Adelaide Hills uh, in mid September. Offline sponsorships can be arranged um, as a written pledge uh, with a minimum five month payment schedule if you put your pledge uh, in writing before midnight tonight. Um, everyone else uh, can visit the um, crowdfunding campaign. Uh, there's the, we'll put that, uh, I'll just put that address in the, uh, in the chat now. And uh, you can go over there and uh, look at all the, the different levels um, of support, uh, starting with, you know, just a, a donation of $50 and you will gain access to Ansbig's website for one month. Uh, $100, you'll gain access for two months. And then uh, if you join Ansbig over the next six weeks, um, we will add that revenue towards this total campaign um, and get us up towards our targets. Uh, the individual levels start uh, and go up to uh, uh, right up to a foundational member. Then we go to the bronze sponsorship, silver sponsorship, gold sponsorship, platinum sponsorship, and diamond sponsorship. Um, so there's a donate button there now, uh, if you would like to, to just donate uh, to, the, uh, to the actual campaign. Or as mentioned, go to Ansbig um, and, uh, and join up there, look at the various levels, and, uh, and then uh, we will add that to our crowdfunding campaign. So um, with that, yes, please join us, um, partner with us, become a road uh, roadmap uh, uh, sponsor, and um, we'll keep you updated with the with the crowdfund uh, as as we're moving through the uh, through the six weeks. So, Sam, I'll hand it uh, back over to you now to go into the uh, to the Q and A. Thanks, Don, and thank you all to our speakers who did a great job of explaining why biochar and why we feel that this um, roadmap is really important. So if I could just ask all of the presenters to just come on and um, put on your cameras, that would be great. And we're joined by Nigel Murphy, our, our chair, and Stephen Joseph, who will, of course, be helping with the roadmap um, as well. Stephen, if you could just pop your, yeah, wonderful, fabulous. Okay, um, so we'll just kind of start at the top. We've got a question here from Phil. What differences are, are there between Australia and Europe in relation to the drivers for the PYCCC? Those differences might be very important to ensure we don't get things wrong. Don't all jump at once. <laughs> I think there might be a question for Stephen, actually. He's probably got the most knowledge in that space. And you need to unmute, Stephen. Unmute, Stephen. Unmute, Stephen. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated question because Europe's not 
a single entity. And there's a very big difference between different countries. So what's happening in Scandinavia is quite different to what's happening in Germany, what's happening in England. Um, I, I think the, the big difference is um, we're much more focused on biochar to mitigate climate change in Australia where the Europeans are much more interested in carbon sequestration. Um, I mean, maybe people would disagree, but I think uh, the effects of climate change on agriculture in Australia are probably going to be greater than they, uh, they are in Europe. Uh, certainly that's the impression I get talking to people. Great, thank you, Stephen. And um, I don't know if maybe you might be the best person to answer this one as well, but just a comment here in regards to bamboo-based biochar. <laughs> Stephen, did you did you catch that? Sorry, I missed um, um, bamboo-based biochar. Um, that's um, okay. So traditionally, bamboo has been used as a medicinal product, um, but it has some really unusual characteristics. Uh, um, it, it's a, <clears throat> essentially a grass, but, but it's got a, uh, a very uniform structure. Um, so it's, it's really good for... Um, as a filtration medium, and um, it's really easy to load it with different sorts of uh, nutrients. Um, I guess when you look at bamboo, it's it's if you look at what's happening. Uh, the other thing about bamboo is the wood vinegar from bamboo is of a really high quality, and um, and that really comes from the practices in Japan and China. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. I hope that that answers your question there, Samir. Um, the next one from Bill Grant is, if biochar persists in soil for decades slash centuries, won't this reduce the need for and the benefits from repeat applications? I'm not sure who wants to have a go at that I'll, one. I'll have a go at that one. Uh, yes, it, it will. It, it, biochar does last in the soil for thousands of years. It depends on um, the quality of the biochar as to how quickly it breaks down. Um, and it depends on what rates it's originally applied at. So I use an analogy of five tonnes per hectare um, across a million hectares. Um, but that's only um, one million hectares is 0.002% of um, Australia's agricultural land. So if we use 384, if biochar was applied across the whole 384 million hectares at five tonnes per hectare, that's 1,820 1, million tonnes of biochar. We're a long way away from producing that amount. Um, and five tonnes per hectare is, um, is it, it, it's, um, a, uh, and a, it's, a, it's one rate um, that has been applied across calcareous soils, but it could be put on heavier in some areas, lighter in others, hence the need for lots more RDNA in this space to work out rates and et cetera for, for the application type. So that covers Thanks, off on some of those things. Great. Yes, um, does anyone else have anything to add there? Yeah, look, um, it, it's, a, it's a, a quite a complicated question in terms of what you're trying to achieve. In terms of view, um, you're much better off if you're looking at at crops of applying biochar every time you add the crop. Um, and, and as a general statement, um, and that goes from all the work we've done on meta-analysis. Um, in terms of uh, what happens when biochar ages, it depends on the soil and the biochar and the crops that you put in. So it's not something that you can have a blanket statement about um, there's been some really nice research work done by Lucas Van Zwieten that basically shows that you can keep on building up soil carbon um, if you uh, more effectively if you actually apply uh, um, an, an initial high rate of application and then a smaller rate 
uh, every year. Um, that hasn't been published yet, but it, it's, uh, and, and I think if you look at traditional practices, um, all of the work that I've done indicates that, that in most societies, biochar was applied either every year or either second or third year. So going back, you know, hundreds of years, the biochar has been used in some societies and thousands in others. Um, the, the practice has always been to apply um, either, either with a crop or at least every two or three years. I think just adding to that is that the problem is um, that we, um, you know, it's, that we'll have too much biochar for agriculture. The problem is we don't have enough for agriculture. And even if we scale it up, uh, you know, there's, that is, that's why we need this, this blueprint to be able to try and bridge that gap between um, having enough for agriculture. Great, thank you so much, Melissa and Stephen for, um, for answering that one. Um, there's a question here, what extent have these claims, the benefits and drawdown capabilities been verified independently and under what conditions? Anyone want to have a go at answering that question? Uh, look, I'm, ha I'm happy to have a go at that. Look, there's been an extraordinary uh, amount of uh, research in, in biochar and uh, um, the persistence of biochar uh, in the soil has, uh, has certainly been well studied. I um, recall a paper from uh, Lehman in 2017 that looked at, uh, looked at the literature in, in this area. We also have examples of uh, terra preta, um, which uh, where the biochar has, has lasted uh, uh, a, thousand, a thousand years or more. And uh, we've also got um, examples, you know, even in our own Australian landscape where, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, biochar charcoal uh, from uh, cooking fires has persisted in the soil environment for, uh, for many thousands of years. So there's certainly been um, a lot of work uh, looking at uh, at biochar, its persistence and and uh, uh, use for uh, many different purposes. Mm. Can I just add that the methodologies are catching up with the accounting, which is the part of the verification process. So, uh, Vera's methodology on um, on uh, applications of biochar is is being recently published, and so we've got the ability to measure, monitor, and um, assure. The, uh, the, the carbon claims for, say, sequestration, for instance, are, are validated. So that's um, the mechanisms are there to make sure that it's real and not, um, you know, you've planted some trees and told someone about it and that's about all the verification that happens. It, it, it's much stronger than that. So, um, and I know a number of people on the panel here know more than, it, more than that it, than, than I do, so happy for them to chip in. Um, ju just to say that um, Lucas Van Zwieten and Annette Cowie and myself, Johannes Lehman, and a bunch of other people have, have um, written a, a paper where we summarise all the data on persistence. Uh, and we also looked at mechanisms rela related to persistence. Um, I think Craig just put it in the chat. Uh, it's The paper's called How Biochar Works and When It Doesn't, a review of mechanisms controlling soil and plant response to biochar. So that's a free download that you can get from Google Scholar, uh, if you just put in my name. Uh, and there's a, there's a large table with a summary of, of uh, all of the work that's been done to measure persistence in soil uh, and a, a, a bit of a summary on the, on the techniques. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, just staying with the carbon credits, your carbon credit platform as far as values to biochar ton is based on, quali on quality of uh, biochar, what per the percentage of carbon in biochar method of distribution to farmlands feeds into the livestock. Well, sorry, I'm not sure if that one. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, there might be others that want to add to it. Um, so 
uh, look, there's different different ways of, of recognising your biochar carbon credits. So there's carbon credits both in making biochar and carbon credits in using biochar. So the carbon credits in making biochar are emission avoidance credits. Um, there's a website, Curo Earth, that um, has a list of the methodology that needs to be followed to make biochar. So that's about the pyrolysis technology and the closed loop and that, um, you know, the, the emissions that are produced um, using that biochar, the transport, all of that has to come into that methodology in making biochar. And there's those carbon credits, there's a range already listed on that Pure Earth website. And there's companies that are also seeking to purchase those credits. Um, and that, that is floated on the market. Some of those credits range from 100 to 160 euro. Then there's carbon credits in using biochar. Um, and, and so and many people are aware of the emission reduction fund. Um, if you use biochar in the soil, say you use it 200 kilos per hectare and you grow your, your card builds by four tonnes per hectare, you need to take that 200 kilos off of um, the actual um, the, the, of, of the carbon credits that you could get back in using the soil. So they're the two types of credits that are available, but there's many ways and means of selling those credits as well as agricultural credits could also be um, floated on the European market if there's a consortium of farmers that wanted to get together and sell their soil carbon credits rather than through the um, emission reduction fund. So there's lots of different ways of doing it. Um, and it's an emerging um, opportunity and, and the carbon credit and carbon trading we, is, is growing rapidly as we get towards 2030 and um, the, the um, carbon neutral targets of many countries. Thanks for that, Melissa. And just speaking about the um, emissions reduction fund, there is a, a question here that's asking, is there a plan to engage with the emission reduction funds to push the creation of the biochar based carbon project methodology in Australia? Like you said, to allow farmers to benefit from the income from carbon credit generation from production and use of biochar. Is there, uh, if there is no official plan for this yet, is it, is it on your radar? And Nigel might want to add to this. Um, firstly, I just wanted to say that ANSBIG also has um, uh, producing uh, standards that you need to follow in both producing and using biochar. And they're really important to make sure that you're using quality and making bi quality biochar. Because um, if there's bad quality biochar used or not produced properly, that could ruin the industry. Um, but yes, ANSBIG and a number of scientists have been engaging with the ERF um, to, um, to um, make sure biochar is included in that. And um, so, Nigel, you might want to add to that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah, look, the reality is that the, um, the voluntary, international voluntary scheme through uh, groups like Puro and um, uh, Carbon Futures has really developed the uh, carbon credit biochar market. We're hoping that uh, you know Australia can can be a leader um, and also develop methodologies uh, uh, for for our context. And you know this is really the the purpose of the roadmap. Um, if if we have if we don't have industry, government, research, and capital all moving together. Um, we're going we're going to be fragmented and it's going to lead to situations which quite frankly we've we've been in where biochar hasn't really been recognized properly in the Australian context as a as a remarkable product with carbon drawdown characteristics so uh, we want we want to move forward and we want to move forward together and I think the roadmap will provide us with the opportunity of, of doing some uh, really positive things here in Australia and New Zealand so we can be uh, a biochar leader. Thanks, Nigel. And I think that kind of leads in uh, nicely to this next question is, is there government support and buy-in for the development of the biochar roadmap? I, th I think I can start there. I think the answer is yes. Um, you know, it's most definitely yes, um, but what we want is more buy-in. So we want federal, state, local governments uh, interested. And, you know, as we speak, 
there's definitely state governments that are very interested in biochar, local governments, and the federal government. But we we need we need action. Uh, now is the time, not for talk, but for action. As we as we described, we've got a a, a huge challenge in terms of uh, with climate change and with uh, quite frankly the wastage of uh, of valuable biomass resources. And uh, what we can do is make a difference and create real carbon drawdown credits. And a lot of other technologies looking at carbon drawdown are probably a fair way into the future. Uh, biochar is here. So let's, let's scale it up through the roadmap. Thanks, Nigel. Um, and speaking of the, the roadmap, there is a question here um, in regards to if the roadmap will consider biochar produced from biosolids from universal sewage waste, uh, sewage treatment. Sorry, got my, my tongue twisted there. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to take that one. Uh, yes, it will. We have uh, a number of people involved have been working with uh, water utilities to help understand the issues around biosolids derived biochar. And uh, we'll, we're making sure that they will be addressed. There's some work going on right now that uh, will feed into a report that we can draw upon for it. Um, just can't go into much detail on it yet, but it's, it's uh, an important part of what we're considering. What, some of the main issues that we're looking at there are around metals concentrations and the resulting product and how that might mean um, going, say, more towards industrial uses. I, just, just to, uh, since I'm involved with Russ in this, um, the other, of, of course, biosolids has a large amount of uh, phosphorus and uh, uh, some nitrogen. Um, we're heading towards peak phosphorus use. Um, so we're also looking at how we can use biosolids uh, to replace uh, chemical phosphorus fertilizers. Um, and, and uh, you know, at the moment where we're basically dumping a lot of phosphorus into a hole where it should be going back into our agricultural land. So um, that's a really important aspect of, of um, using uh, biosolids biochar. The, the interesting thing, and this comes back to debates we've had, is that um, biosolids biochar is actually very good at taking up heavy metals, uh, but it also uh, it, it has a reasonably high concentration of heavy metals. So in many respects, uh, you can't use it because the regulations specify total heavy metals, not bioavailable heavy metals. So one of the other areas that especially Craig and myself have, have been pushing forward was um, how do you how do you look at what's the safe level of, of uh, biochar with heavy metals? Um, can we look at it in a, um, a more lateral way, which is looking at bioavailability? Um, how you might lock up that that heavy metals so that when it goes into the ground, it's not going to be toxic. Um, so there's there's some interesting things that the the group of us are. Are looking at to try and actually recycle those nutrients that are in biosolids so so that they're, it's safe. Thanks Stephen. Um, just one last question I think before we uh, close up uh, for today and apologies if we haven't got to your question I will make sure that um, we get those questions out to our presenters and we'll follow that up through an, an email of source so then that any way you can get your questions answered. Um, the last one, will the roadmap include New Zealand as well or will it be separate New Zealand roadmap be developed in the future? It will include New Zealand as well as part of an integrated approach. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Russ. And thank you to all of our presenters um, and for Nigel and Stephen for coming on board. And I will now hand it back to Don, who will just close up for today's webinar. Yes, thanks, everyone. Um, I just wanted to um, yeah, just highlight again 
um, our, our crowdfunding campaign and also to uh, thank our current uh, sponsors, uh, so the industry sponsors that have come on board. We do envisage that 50% um, of, of these funds will be raised um, by the industry um, with the view that it will be matched by the government. So um, the diamond sponsor uh, so far is NPS World um, with 15,500. So that's with the Ansby uh, foundational and membership discount. Thank you to Earth Systems, who is also diamond sponsor of the roadmap. Um, also thanks to Energy Link Services, uh, who is a silver uh, sponsor. Um, thank you very much. And Byron Biochar uh, as, a, uh, as an industry uh, contributor level. So uh, as mentioned, we are looking to reach our first uh, fundraising milestone of 65,000 by midnight tonight. Um, and you can either go on to the donate button here uh, to donate directly to the, uh, to the campaign, or you can send us an email. So please email me directly, execdirect at ansbig.org. Uh, if you put in a written pledge uh, by midnight tonight, uh, you can um, have a payment schedule of a mi minimum monthly payment over the next six months up to our, our summit uh, in mid-September. So um, yes, please donate to the campaign and help us reach that first milestone. Um, I'm going to uh, leave you with the uh, video from the campaign and uh, we look forward to keeping, keeping you updated as we progress. And thanks again to all our presenters today.